my name is Mike Seidman. I'm uh, uh, just really delighted to be here. Your, your campus is beautiful. And I have to say, if I were you, I'm not sure I wouldn't be out at the farmer's market <laughs> rather than in here. But it's, it's really a pleasure to be here. And I, I, it's really a, a special honor to be invited by, by Lara Schwartz. She is, as I think people in this room all already know, a really special person. And you are just very, um, very lucky to have her here. So um, I am um, uh, mostly interested in talking about this rather than uh, talking at you. So I'm going to try to keep this my talking part to maybe 15 minutes or so. Um, I, I, I have to tell you, um, I last, last said something spontaneous to somebody in 1983, and that turned out to be a big mistake. Larry doesn't re re realize it, but when I said hello to her just now, I had it all written out. Um, so so I, I, I do have some stuff in writing here in front of me. Um, if I'm going to keep this short, um, I might as well just really get to the point in a hurry. So the title of this presentation or whatever it is was, um, can free speech be progressive and I won't beat around the bush? The correct answer is no. Um, now, uh, that answer, at least I think that's the correct answer. Now, that answer uh, comes as a surprise to me among other people. Um, I was somebody who grew up admiring a Supreme Court that upheld the rights of radicals and discontents and who thought that conservatives and reactionaries were the people trying to uh, stifle full discussion of ideas and thought that uh, free speech was an important part of the left's program. And, and I, I have to say, I mean, I, I, you know, I teach at a university. What we do for a living is talk about things. And so I, I do still think people ought to say what's on their mind and that a free exchange of ideas is really uh, important diverse points of view, and so on. And um, I have a, even now, a kind of nostalgic uh, attraction to the law of free speech. But I do think we have to be uh, realistic about things. And the truth of the matter is, we have to, what, if you look at what free speech has turned into now, um, in the hands of the modern Supreme Court, what freedom of speech means is the right of corporations and rich people to distort our electoral process by spending unlimited amounts of money. It's the right of cigarette companies to encourage potential customers to kill themselves with tobacco. It's the right of sadists to market movies that show animals being tortured. Um, it's the right of abortion providers to mislead people seeking abortions about the kind of help they're going to get at the establishment they're uh, in. Uh, it's the right of the Boy Scouts to discriminate against the LBTG community, Q community. Um, that's all those are rights. That's what the Supreme Court has said the First Amendment means. And um, there's just nothing progressive about any of that. Um, now. There is a natural reaction to that, and that is to say, well, that's just because we have a terrible Supreme Court. Um, it's a Supreme Court that misunderstands what free speech is about. If we had a court that was really devoted to an authentic principle of free, free speech, then uh, free speech would be progressive. I think that's wrong. Um, but it will take some work to explain why, at least I think it's wrong. Uh, but before I start doing that work, I th it's important, I think, just to make clear some things that I'm not saying. So first, um, by freedom of speech, I'm referring here only to the American free speech tradition. I'm not talking about some conceivable version of the tradition that might exist elsewhere in some other country or some other time and place. Um, second, I'm, to say that a free speech right is not progressive is not the same thing as saying it's evil. So there are lots of things that aren't especially progressive but I think are good. Uh, chocolate ice cream and um, baseball come to mind. Those are things that I think are really good, but they're not 
particularly progressive, and, and free speech might be like that. And a third, I'm, I'm not saying that in isolated cases, progressive lawyers can't use free speech argument to benefit their clients. Um, actually, we have a long and honorable, honorable record of progressive lawyers doing just that. Um, so the First Amendment prevented the suppression of labor picketing in the 1930s and 40s. It prevented the suppression of civil rights demonstrations in the 1960s. It protected the New York Times when it published an advertisement defending Martin Luther King Jr. and when it, some years later, published a report discrediting the Vietnam War. Uh, constitutional protection for freedom of speech shielded anti-war protesters who proclaimed that they wanted to fuck the draft. Uh, artists who challenged conventional morality, school children who um, resisted compelled patriotic indoctrination, and so forth. So you might say, well, what is not progressive about all that? And, and if, if that's all progressive, what, what am I saying? Um, well, yes, the First Amendment has occasional utility um, uh, in protecting progressives. Um, and it might even protect uh, us from some very severe downside risks, I think. Myself, those risks are somewhat overstated, but I'm not going to deny that it might provide some protection. But here's what I want to say the First Amendment cannot do. Um, it cannot be of significant help in realizing progressive goals or in acting a pro progressive program. And in some respects, it, it stands in the way of that. And furthermore, that's not just because of an evil Supreme Court. Um, the fact that the First Amendment can't be progressive is woven into the basic commitments at the core of the American idea of free speech. So why is that? Well, the basic problem is this. Um, if progressives stand for anything at all, uh, they stand for the idea that supposedly free markets don't necessarily produce a fair allocation of life opportunities. So unregulated markets produce tremendous wealth on the one hand and grinding poverty on the other. These are not states that people deserve, and the government has an obligation to correct them. And how does it correct them? It corrects them largely through uh, regulating and disciplining the market. Um, in other words, there's nothing sac for progressives, there's nothing sacrosanct about wealth and property. The government could and should redistribute we, we dis, uh, distribute goods to make our society fairer and to dismantle unjust hierarchies of power and privilege. I take that to be, if, if, if you don't believe that, you're, you're not a progressive, which is not to say you're necessarily wrong, but you're not a progressive if you don't believe those things. But freedom of speech is in tension with that core progressive commitment. And that's because the ability to speak necessarily depends on one's possession of property. So speech has to occur someplace. Um, and generally, the someplace where it occurs is owned by someone. To be effective, it has to be amplified in some way. And the means of amplification, newspapers, TV stations, Google, Facebook, they're also property that's privately owned. Now, with regard to all other forms of property, progressives understand that the government has a role to play in redistributing those resources. I think progressives need to recognize that exactly the same point holds with regard to property that's used for speech purposes. Here's another way to make the same point. Um, for conservatives, there's a, sort of an unthinking and automatic association between the absence of government and freedom. So markets are said to be free when the government doesn't control them. Um, progressives reject that equation. They insist that at least some of the time, it's not the absence of government. It is government regulation of markets that makes us free. Why? Because it controls private coercion that limits our freedom. 
So just to take one of a zillion different examples, think about the 1964 Civil Rights Act that prevents um, racial discrimination in places of public accommodation. So before 1964, and I'm old enough to remember this well, um, I'm <laughs> afraid. Um, I also remember 1864, actually. That was, that was a great year, the middle of the Civil War. But I'm going to talk about 1964. Um, African Americans traveling or living in the South were not free. So if you were taking a road trip and you couldn't find a place to pee or to buy lunch, um, um, that was a big problem. It, it, it meant that really you weren't free to travel. Um, and now, so Congress enacted a law, it was first proposed and then enacted a law to do something about that, the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Conservatives like Ronald Reagan, William F. Buckley, Robert Bork, all those people said, this is a horrible law. It ought never to be passed. Why? Because it interfered with the freedom of merchants to be racists. Um, now today, I think, almost everybody understands that that had it backward. The law was part of a, a necessary, great, and unfinished product, uh, a project of making African Americans truly free. But if that's true about public accommodations, then why isn't it true about speech as well? So just as conservatives think um, markets are free when there's no government, so too, the very words of the First Amendment say speech is free when Congress makes no laws. Um, but why would one think that? Um, so suppose, for example, that Facebook takes down a post that say, says something uncomplimentary about our present esteemed President of the United States. Um, under standard free speech theory, that is a manifestation of Facebook's freedom of speech, just like the refusal of merchants to serve African Americans is a manifestation of the merchant's freedom. Um, if, Facebook if the government tells Facebook that they have to publish my post, that's an invasion of their free speech rights. That's just like the argument that Robert Bork, Ronald Reagan, and William F. Buckley um, made against the 1964 Civil Rights Act. But, so I understand why conservatives take that position, but why on earth would progressives accept it? I thought progressives understood that markets don't magically produce justice in the absence of government regulation, and sometimes it's the regulation rather than its absence that makes us free. So what gives me a free speech right might be for the government to tell Facebook, uh-uh, you've, you've got to publish that post. Um, uh, otherwise, my, my freedom of speech is substantially limited. Um, so because this assumption uh, of the justice of free markets is built into the architecture of free speech law, um, the modern conservative slant on free speech doctrine is not just an uh, ephemeral contingency. It, it is what the free speech tradition in some respects stands for. Beyond that though, there's another reason why free speech doctrine is anti-progressive, and that's because at its core, I believe like constitutional obligation generally, but I'm for present purposes going to limit it to free, free speech law, I think it's authoritarian. Um, now that seems very strange because, of course, one of the first things authoritarians typically do is limit freedom of speech. Um, but I do think constitutionalization of free speech is um, authoritarian because an assertion that the Constitution requires a certain state of affairs, like freedom of speech, is a way of avoiding the necessity for providing actual reasons why that state of affairs is desirable or just. Um, if the Constitution requires something, then at least in the American political culture, that's the end of the argument. There's nothing more 
um, you can say, short of a constitutional amendment, a constitutional requirement that a thing must be done, just means that it must be done. And once that requirement is established, there's nothing left to talk about. So oddly enough, a constitutional right to free speech cuts off the ability to actually talk about things. Um, and that fact about contemporary constitutional culture produces another and uh, even more perplexing paradox. Uh, the constitutional right to free speech is actually at war with freedom of thought. Um, so here is elsewhere an assertion of a constitutional right shuts down and sidetracks serious thought about the problem. Um, when the Supreme Court says, for example, that the First Amendment affords sadists the right to, on a movie camera, crush defenseless animals, uh, and by the way, the Supreme Court has held that, that you have, you have a First Amendment right to stomp on some poor animal and, and, and stomp it to death, um, or that um, the free speech right means that religious fanatics have the right to disrupt the funeral of dead soldiers, uh, and the Supreme Court has said that as well. Um, that's really the end of the argument. Now, that's not quite true. You could, if you want to, get down in the weeds about this and talk about this the way lawyers talk about it. That is to say, um, gee, talk about profoundly irrelevant things like what did James Madison think 200 years ago, or what exactly is the precise relationship uh, between uh, the First Amendment language and language in the 1688 English Bill of Rights? Right? I mean, you can do that. Um, but none of that is what um, is actually at stake here. If you want to talk instead about the merits, why exactly should we? allow people to stomp on defenseless animals? What are we getting from that? What social policy is that serving? That's really off the table, because it, it really doesn't matter. Um, even if you, if, if, if you convince me you're completely right, this is really stupid, the answer is, well, you have to do it because the First Amendment requires it. And that's the end of the discussion. And making that the end of the discussion um, I think abrogates the first duty that we have to each other as citizens, and that is the duty um, to um, justify our positions um, to other people, to our fellow citizens, with publicly accessible arguments. In other words, the First Amendment provides an excuse for not speaking, not listening, and not thinking. Um, all right, let me finish this way. Uh, there's a law professor who I really admire at the University of Chicago. Her name is Laura Weinrib. And uh, she begins her magnificent history of the ACLU, it's a book length history, um, with the observation that civil liberties were once radical. Um, but she says they were radical in days when free speech advocates embraced rights that were prior to and independent of the Constitution, and that were secured without recourse to law. Um, they were, they were uh, as she puts it, a right to agitation that was enforced by workers going into the streets or occupying plants and things like that. Translating that non-legal right of agitation into a constitutional right of free speech, she argues, means tying the right to current property distributions, associating with it with government passivity, and asserting the right by fiat rather than trying to persuade people that the right is a good idea. In other, in other words, it means turning the right into something that's not progressive. Um, and, and Weinrib describes in a lot of detail what happened to the ACLU when it made that fateful bargain. So in her words, uh, by the early 1940s, civil liberties were no longer radical. The ACLU had naively hoped in an era when revolution seemed possible that a mere right to agitate would pave the way to substantive change. Implicit in their position was the confidence that radicalism could uh, prevail in the marketplace of ideas, 
By the 1940s, employers understood that no free exchange of ideas existed. They understood that a right to free speech would ordinarily favor those with superior resources. Um, um, that's what Weinreb says. As she recounts, those were lessons learned a long time ago. And yet, many modern progressives uh, seem to have forgotten them. They just can't shake their mindless attraction to the bright flame of our free speech tradition. Progressives need to turn away from that flame before they're burned again. So those are my uh, views. Uh, so I, I do believe in um, open debate. I am just confident not everybody in this room agrees with them. So why don't we have a conversation? Yeah. Hi. Hi. All right, that's the end of the conversation. <laughs> no. well, I'm just curious, like, if progressives accept that argument, like, so what, like, what next? Like, what, what follows from it? Yeah, like, what kind of, like, how would, do you think that would impact, like, strategy of the group and what the progressives would do with that? So, um, the, the, the most immediate effect it has is uh, progressives ought to stop being um, ambivalent or supportive when the Supreme Court makes these outrageous decisions. So, so my friends at the ACLU, um, they support a lot of this stuff. And, um, and I just don't think they ought to. Um, more broadly, I, I, so this is a, a point that goes beyond the First Amendment. Um, but I think um, progressives much too often rely on law and legal arguments uh, to get their way. Uh, because of a very brief experience in our history, now 75 years ago, they think that constitutional law and um, the Supreme Court is going to just magically save us and that we don't have to do the hard work of convincing other Americans that we're right and they're wrong. And um, this is especially a problem, I think, with regard to President Trump and, and the, the, just in the last week, we've seen how progressives have been burned by this because th there was so much weight put on a legal argument that Trump had violated the law. And so when uh, Mueller comes back and says, as a technical legal matter, actually he didn't violate the law, all of a sudden all the air goes out of the balloon. And that's just a mistake. It, 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 uh, what, what we ought to think about the Trump presidency does not turn on the technicalities of um, obstruction of justice statutes, right? It turns on the fact that this guy, pardon me, is a fascist and an idiot. Um, and those are not legal concepts. Um, and so what we have to do is um, not rely on law, not rely on the Supreme Court. We have to do the hard work of convincing people that we're right and they're wrong. Sorry for going on so long. Yeah. So if, um, you, like, if there isn't a sort of constitutional right to free speech, for example, and, there is, and, and you sort of talk about how certain things like stomping on animals or protesting you know, uh, funerals of soldiers shouldn't be acceptable, like who Right. So um, we, I think we figured out the way we figure out um, uh, anything else. So I, uh, um, I think we ought to have a public option, at least with health care, and, um, and maybe a, a single payer. Maybe you don't. Maybe you think that's a bad idea. So what do we do? We talk about it. And I make arguments, and you make arguments. And in the end, we decide what's best for the country. Um, but here's what we don't do. I, we don't say, I, I don't say to you, because you don't believe in um, a public option for health care, you're not a real American. You're not part of our political community. And, and therefore, I don't even have to explain to you why. <laughs> 
it's a good idea. Because you're just out, you know, I just can forget about you. And that's what you say, in effect, when you say, this is required by our Constitution. Um, so you, we decide the way we, you know, there's not, I don't know how people change their minds. That's a really deeply mysterious thing, right? But what we do is we talk to each other and people come to judgments about what the best, all things considered, what the best thing to do is. But wouldn't that, um, you know, presumably that would involve having to then bring a democratic back to the majority vote for that. And then conceivably you could be silencing minorities, minority rights if you have, a, you know, like 60% of America doesn't want so-and-so to be able to speak in this way. But that 40% is now trumped, is, you know, by not having so, um, every law that uh, Congress passes helps some people and hurts other people. Um, when Congress passed the 1964 Civil Rights Act, uh, that hurt the merchants who were racists. They wanted to keep uh, black people out of their establishments and they couldn't anymore. So, so yes, whatever we do, some people are going to be hurt. When, when Facebook has the right to take down my post, that hurts me, right? So now, so now I'm, especially because Facebook is pretty much a monopoly, um, now I can't get my message out. So, so I, why is it that you think that the problem is only when Congress acts rather than, than, maybe the problem is that they're not regulating Facebook, right? That might be, uh, that, that also hurts people and that also obstructs speech. And, and just again, that's the, that is the key progressive insight. That's what make, I, I'm, maybe there are conservatives in the room, I don't know, and I, we could talk about whether we ought to be conservatives or progressives. And, and maybe I'm convincing the conservatives this is why you ought to be a conservative, right? Um, and I, I can see that. In some ways, this supports the conservative point. But, but for progressives, um, it's just a mystery why one would have that insight about, say, the 1964 Civil Rights Act, but not have the insight about regulating Facebook. By the way, be, we're, we're a small enough group, so I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable making this more informal. People can just, just sort of say what they want to say. So I may be misunderstanding you. Why does it align with a smaller government? So because, from what I understood, when you put this label, when you make it const a constitution right of free speech, um, then it silences. So you're saying opening up to more discussion on what we should all agree on and changing hearts and minds instead of necessarily like the constitutionality. Yeah. Um, Sometimes, like a lack of constitution or potentially legislation led to like a smaller government. Well, we, so we're, we're, what we're left with is we have to decide what kind of government we want. And if if um, the American people in the end decide they want a smaller government, I guess I personally I think that might be a bad idea. But I'm just one person out of many, and so we ought to have a smaller government. Um, if if we think we ought to have a bigger government, then I don't want the Supreme Court saying you can't do that because it's unconstitutional. But the basic point, I guess, is, I mean, the point of the second half of what I said, we ought to have free speech about free speech, right? So, so what, what it means for speech actually to be free, that's a complicated question and, and it's, um, um, there were, things to be said on both sides of it. There, there were also things to be said on both sides of whether free speech is always a good thing. You know, it, a speech, speech creates costs. Um, it, it, um, it can destroy people. Um, um, it, 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 it 
silence people, it can hurt their feelings, it can uh, ruin their livelihoods, it, 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 it can destroy them. Now sometimes those costs are worth bearing, sometimes they're not. But anyway, uh, we, we ought not to just assume that uh, speech is always good, sometimes it's bad. And sometimes um, maybe there's a role to play in government government in regulating who speaks and what they say and when they say it and so on. Can we just regulate ourselves? I mean, the First Amendment doesn't purport to be a blueprint about how to live or how to make your grandmother proud. It's, it's just this limitation. It just takes this one thing off the table. Okay, we're not going to punish people who stop from saying stuff. Why is that the end of the conversation? Well, because, because again... Lawyers are out of work, but ethicists and ministers and these people can get in the mix now. So um, um, suppose we try that out on some other things. So um, uh, look, um, one might say uh, the contract clause in the Constitution means I get to decide for myself whether as an employer I want to pay the minimum wage. Right? It, it, just, it doesn't say maybe if I were a good person, my clergy person would tell me, no, you ought to pay somebody $15 an hour, but that's for me to decide, right? And, and uh, if, if I want to pay somebody $7 an hour, that's fine. Um, now, I, Lara, I don't think you'd say that. Am I wrong? No, you're correct. All right, so, 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 the, so. I'm not sure you're right that, that the analogy is perfect. Okay, so let's talk about that. Why, what's so, wrong with it? So we have bad speech, speech that hurts, speech that speech that makes it harder for people to go to school here by you know, minimizing you know, humanity and treating them like, hey, slavery was great, right? We've had bias incidents here. So it's very, it's just, uh, so there's hurtful speech. Um, you can think of a million ways of preventing hurtful speech. And it includes one of the things we do here, which is education. Yeah. Just trying to help people right. do better. Right. So, so let's. Why so, 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 okay. So let's. Gee, I have a great idea. Um, why doesn't the government fund a program whereby people like you go into corporate boardrooms and you educate people about how bad it is to pay the subminimum wage? Right. Or, or better yet, I mean, so let's have uh, let's have an education program about all the carnage that's caused when people drive 65 miles an hour on the Beltway. Um, I'm not against that. I, I, I think it might work some, but you know what? I, st I think we still need speed limits um, because, because when you drive more than 65 miles an hour, you're hurting other people. Um, and uh, people have a right not to be hurt. Um, and, and here's another point. Um, if you want to get from point A to point B, um, it's just not true that the absence of government is, is going to get you there most efficiently. You need somebody to say, well, you, you drive on the right lane and not the left lane, and, and, and you don't speed, and you don't, um, you, know, you don't follow too closely. Go, um, it's government intervention, government regulation of freedom that actually makes us more free. Because if you didn't have that, um, the, the highways would be zoos and you'd not be able to get to work. I think that presupposes that people are going to imagine human decency as an imposition on their freedom as opposed to an opportunity. Mm. Well, I do know, um, <laughs> I, I guess what I want to say is you better talk to those animals who get crushed, right? Uh, they're dead, right? <laughs> um, or, or you want to talk to the uh, the families of the uh, the veterans who uh, are trying to bury their dead and have have these people with placards saying. I want to talk to the athletes who are taking a knee to protest police violence, who would be the first people on the chopping block with government regulation of speech. So, so if if I'm in charge of things, I would not shut down that speech. I would. Um, we sort of but elected somebody other than you. That, that, over that's true. For me. That's true. But <laughs> but again, what I want to say is the solution to that problem is to elect somebody else. Um, it's it's not to count on the Supreme Court 
And there's another point uh, that I didn't make because of the absence of time, but it, it is really, um, it's worth thinking about. If, if, if you uh, look at the history of the First Amendment throughout our history, uh, and, and of the Supreme Court's enforcement of the First Amendment, uh, the notion that um, it is what has protected us from shutting down protests against the president or something like that, um, it, it, it turns out mostly not to be true. So um, at the time when uh, First Amendment rights were most at risk, the Supreme Court uh, deserted the battlefield. Um, during World War I, uh, there were thousands of anti-war uh, protesters who were locked up. Uh, Eugene Debs, who got several million votes uh, for president, was locked up. By the way, this was by a progressive administration, by the Wilson administration. Um, the Supreme Court, by the way, in, in opinions joined by Brandeis and Holmes, um, affirmed all those convictions. Um, See, now that speech ought not to be allowed. <laughs> um, and, and, um, it, and a similar thing happened during the McCarthy period. Um, so a majority of the Supreme Court um, uh, affirmed the criminal convictions of the um, leaders of the American Communist Party. They were sentenced to years in prison, and the Supreme Court said that was fine. Um, most of the courts pro-free speech um, opinions have come in periods when free speech wasn't under pressure in the first place. Are these terrible examples of the Supreme Court's jurisprudence and free speech examples of democratic majorities passing laws that restrict speech in ways that are conservative or progressive? So it, it doesn't really take up the worry that empowering government to censor will be progressive. It just sort of says it's possible it could be progressive. So, these are well, examples of it being sometimes it'll be progressive, sometimes it won't. But um, my point is, um, don't look to the Supreme Court to make it more progressive. So I guess I, I will take well your point that uh, you know, the Supreme Court isn't going to be progressive. But I guess more needs to be uh, argued in terms of, as it currently stands, uh, political processes being progressive. So um, if the argument is that sort of the powers that influence the court uh, also influence you know, democratic majorities that are elected. Through what? Through the electoral college and so forth. So yeah. Not, not, I won't call it a majority, so, uh, majority, um, uh, progressives have a problem. Um, they are always uh, fighting uh, an uphill battle, and uh, there are going to be lots of losses on the way. And I, all victories are, are temporary. Um, 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 the the uh, so, so it's just an endless struggle, and it's a struggle against the odds. Um, and, and that's because um, we start from a position where wealth and power is not fairly distributed in the country. And wealth and power affects the Supreme Court. It affects, the, uh, it affects elections. It affects politicians. Um, and if, if, you're not, if you don't believe in, in armed revolution, and I don't, if, if for no other reason than because I think it's completely impractical. Um, um, and there, there might be other reasons to oppose it as well, but that's, that's the first one. So if that's not going to work, the only choice is to fight this kind of uphill battle. There's no way around it. And so, so um, I think too many progressives have, have this idea of a, a kind of fairy godmother who is in the Supreme Court who's looking benevolently over us, and they're going to come and rescue us um, at the crucial moment and just impose, say, sorry, this is, we're now going to have a just society. That's, that's silly. And it's, it's more than silly. It's dangerous. Because those guys are not our friends. And, and the, basic, the basic fundamentals of constitutional law are on their side. Because, because free speech and most of other constitutional law rests on existing entitlements. So, so look, um, if you ask the question, 
uh, who really has freedom of speech in the United States? Fox News, right? And why do they have freedom of speech? There's, there was this great um, um, press critic years ago who used to write for the New Yorker named A.J. Liebling, and he, he said, freedom of the press means you have freedom if you can buy a press, right? So Fox News, they have a, a freedom of speech because um, this one guy, Rupert Murdoch, is a billionaire. It's not just that he's a billionaire. That's not right. Um, um, uh, but that affects who gets to speak and who doesn't. Uh, so, so if I want to be on Fox News, uh, except when they occasionally put me on to make fun of me, um, uh, they're going to say tough luck. And why is that? That's because Murdoch owns property and I don't. And that's not right. That's, uh, it's not fair that he has all that property and, and the rest of the stuff. Well, I feel like it's, it's, it's maybe a bit of a mischaracterization to say that progressives imagine there's a fairy godmother in the Supreme Court. Like, I don't think many progressives really have placed their full idealism in the Supreme Court. They recognize its limitations. Good. And they, and they recognize I'm delighted to hear that. But it's, there's, but the Bill of Rights in the Constitution at least provides some check on the inequalities of the capitalist system. I, so, I, or I think it largely aggravates it rather than providing a check. Okay, but we're not going to get rid of the Constitution anytime soon. Really. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, we live in a very strange age. I have no idea what's going to happen. Okay. Um, but but I, I, do think, I, I do think that um, progressive support for constitutional law generally is a mistake. Okay. To make it a little more specific, and to take up the example of the NFL players protesting, um, is um, could it be that the cost of protecting progressive speech is also protecting regressive speech and people crushing animals and doing other horrible things? Because the danger to me in, in scrapping the you know in scrapping the free speech right is when you have a regressive demagogue come to power when he could you know, conceivably s suppress in really awful ways um, speech. Yeah, so, so first of all, I think the NFL is, a, is an odd example for you to choose because who is it who's interfering with the speech of, of Colin Kaepernick? It's not the government. It's the NFL. The NFL, they've got a lot of power, but they're not the government, okay? So if you're interested in Colin Kaepernick's free speech right, what you want is the government to intervene to tell the NFL to cut it out. But, but the government under President Trump would intervene to put him in jail. Right. Would. So, so um, um, again, what I want to do is just transfer this argument over to uh, other areas that progressives um, care about. So progressives believe in a redistribution of property, a re redistribution of wealth. But you might say, but, but gee whiz, why would you believe in that? Because if, if you have Do Donald Trump in office, what he's going to do is redistribute wealth in favor of rich people, mm -hmm. right? And of course that's true. And you know, if I thought that risk was serious enough, um, I might not be a progressive anymore, right? So what you're talking me into is being a libertarian. If you really think the government is just always going to make things worse, uh, no matter what we do, uh, then I think uh, we ought to stop being progressives and be libertarians. We ought to say, no, we don't believe in government because government's evil. Um, and, and you know what? Um, sort of twice a week I wake up in the, the morning and I think, gee whiz, maybe I should be a libertarian. Maybe I ought to be conservative. And, and when Donald Trump is president, you know, it, it begins to be three times a week. Um, but I... I, I do think um, if there is any hope of, at all of making our society more just, more fair, more solidistic, more empathetic, um, it, it's going to come from government. It's going to be because the government does things like pass the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Um, um, 
And, and if that's true, then the last thing you want to do is buy into an ideology that says government's the problem. Just on the notion of fighting an uphill battle and sort of trying to yeah. change hearts and minds, I know in your thesis and introduction you, you acknowledge the utility argument of free speech, but at a certain point it seems like you're going to have to come up against that in your idea of what progressive free speech can be. So how do you, what do you say to someone that puts the utility argument I don't know what you, what you mean by the utility argument. The idea that free speech is the greatest mechanism we have for identifying, articulating, and solving problems in this society. So um, let, let, let's suppose for the moment that, that you think that's true. I, I, I'm a little skeptical. But let's, let's suppose you think it's true. That the next question I want to ask is, what do you mean by free speech? Um, so African Americans weren't free to travel in the South before the 1964 Civil Rights Act. I'm not free um, to speak when Facebook takes down my post. Right? So, so one, one answer to that might be, OK, yes, free speech is really important. What makes speech free is when Congress makes laws rather than when Congress makes no laws. The, the First Amendment says, uh, because of freedom of speech, Congress shall make no laws. Maybe it should say, because of freedom of speech, Congress should make laws. Um, I'm, I'm also, I have to say, I'm, I am a little skeptical about um, the power of freedom of speech to get to the right answer. Um, and, and here, I mean, this is in deep tension with the way I make my living and what I'm doing right now, right? Because I do, on some level, I do believe it's worthwhile talking to people and having the dialogues. My mind gets changed, your mind gets changed. But um, I'm, I'm not so sure that's how things work on a mass scale. So um, if you ask the question, for example, is uh, uh, Beto O'Rourke going to get elected president? I think a lot of, if he does, a lot of the reason will be because, my God, when he takes off his t-shirt, uh, people go crazy. Right? Um, 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 people, people, when you ask why do people really change their minds, I don't know how often somebody is actually argued into a position. Um, so I, I'll just give a, uh, some personal history here. Um, I um, am really ashamed to say um, early on in the Vietnam War period, I was for the war. I was, I was, I thought the war was a pretty good idea. So I was maybe in my first year of college or something like that. And what I'd like to say is I read a whole bunch of books about Vietnam and I, I understood the arguments about it and I came to see that this was cruel and evil because of the arguments. Um, when I think about how I actually changed my mind, I think it, that really had very little to do with it. What, what, what happened to me was I looked around at the people who were against the war, and I looked around at the people who were for the war. And I didn't much like the people who were, against, who were for the war, and I liked the people who were against the war. And I wanted to be like them. Um, and so I became like them by being against the war. In other words, it, it, it's a really complicated process, and maybe speech has something to do with it. But, but the notion that we come to most of our, our, our ideas through a kind of reasoned process, that, uh, that the, the kind of thing that, that Milton or Holmes had in mind, I think that might be pretty unrealistic, actually. I don't know. What do you think? Well, I was just going to ask on the follow-up to that. So it seems like your idea of we need to get to a better society, and one of the ways to do that is to have a conversation about free speech and how it can possibly be changed. Are we trying to, for an overall goal, are we trying to, are we trying to discredit or get rid of bad ideas, or are we trying to point people towards good ones more? So, um, I guess the one thing that um, I feel strongly about uh, um, is that it is wrong to try to win an argument by just saying to somebody, "You have to agree with me." Um, and I'm not going to tell you why. 
Now, now I, I do think that's in some tension with what I just said, because the alternative to that is giving reasons. And reasons don't much matter. Then why am I so uh, attracted to reasons? So, so I think you've got me in a kind of contradiction. Um, but but um, I guess what I would say is I do believe in reason giving at least enough to think that one ought not to just insist as a matter of pure power, you've got to agree with me. And, and that's the problem with arguing from a constitutional right. It's, it, it cuts off the obligation to give reasons. I guess everybody's uh, convinced. This is one point about your Vietnam yeah. anecdote or experience. I mean, I think you could argue that it actually was free speech in a sense that changes your mind speech isn't necessarily limited to like posting on Facebook or like reading a yeah. document in a library. It's it's how someone portrays themselves and what you're picking up in everyday conversation. Um, so yeah. I think there's still like the idea of speech being the culmination of everything you're saying to make you a person. It's yeah, so, so certainly um, <laughs> if, if, if you really had a totalitarian government that was controlling all of our interactions so that, I mean, one of the, when you read about East Germany, one of the awful things about the way things were then was that you just could not have a normal interaction with somebody because the Stasi was every, every place and, and you just had to be very careful about the most casual sorts of things. So in a world like that, um, w what I'm talking about couldn't happen. Um, um, so, so, so I think that's right. Um, but, but that's... Those kind of interactions are very different from saying, from reading a newspaper editorial or a book or something like that. It, it's more, um, it, it, it's both more subtle and more mysterious than that. It, it is just kind of, um, um, I don't know, the, 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 the Quakers, I think, have an expression called witnessing. So you're witnessing how another person is living their, li their life, and you want to live it your life that way. Um, that's the this, this sort of thing I have in mind. So, so if, if all these factors in society and discourse are so you know, unpredictable, and you know, I think if we learn anything in the past few years is that norms can be broken, and yeah. society doesn't always progress in the way we necessarily want it to, like what, so like, the issue I see is if, like, I think you're right that, like, sometimes having a constitutional right can cut off an argument, but I think if we're going to be fighting this uphill battle anyway, I think it, maybe, is, do you think it's worth it to get rid of that protection in order to hopefully have a better argument, or do you think, because would it be better to keep that restriction because, like, you know, we were saying how Trump could, a Trump and a Republican majority could pass a law you know, putting Colin Kaepernick in jail, and Obama and the Democrats. And and, and 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 what makes you think that he wouldn't get away with it? That the Supreme Court would say, "No, you can't do that." But I think like all the people in the system can change, and all the ideas in the system can change. But isn't part of the point of having a constitution that there are certain things that we agree that are so fundamental that they should be? So I want to say. Uh, who, who is the we, white man? <laughs> right? I, I didn't agree to this. When did I agree? Um, this was a, the First Amendment was agreed to a, a, a bunch of by, by a bunch of people um, in 1791. Um, they were <laughs> I wasn't there. None of my relatives were there. Right? My, my relatives were wandering around someplace in Eastern Europe at the time. Probably knew nothing about it, so so I don't know what you mean by we all agree to it. I, 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 as a matter of fact, I don't agree with it. Well, what, what comes to mind for me with talk of like removing or changing the First Amendment is talk of like in the Senate removing, you know, the possibility of the filibuster, and it feels like it just sort of making change easier. So it just feels like there'd be bigger swings back and forth. Yeah, in in making changes easier you're also opening yourself up to like you know more conservative enforcement of things you disagree with so um, for, first of all it, it it makes change easier but it might also make change harder 
So um, if Fox News were, were, were broken up um, um, so that Rupert, there's a long article in the Times today, quite a remarkable thing about Rupert Murdoch and how he's controlling the world. Um, if, if his power were limited, he wants, he wants to change some things also, right? And, and that, might make, uh, that might make that change harder. Um, um, so, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, um, I, I guess the question is, um, what kinds of changes uh, are we talking about? So, so um, l l l let's take, um, so, so suppose we take um, the Senate. Um, so the Constitution, uh, uh, forget about the filibuster, the Constitution requires um, that the Senate be apportioned in a way that there's no relationship to population the three people who live in Wyoming have as much power as the millions of people who live in California. So that makes change harder for a majority of Americans. Um, um, if uh, the Senate were uh, uh, um, the Senate were apportioned on the basis of population, um, um, the last two Supreme Court justices wouldn't be there, right? So is that a good thing because it makes change harder? I, I don't see why. Um, if, if the majority of the people want to live in a certain kind of country and they're pre prevented from doing so, why is that a good thing? Well, will it, would it be progressive? Uh, if a majority of people decided they want to live in free speech rights? I, I actually think uh, the country would be more progressive because it turns out the people who have the disproportionate power in the Senate tend to be people who live in uh, rural areas that are deep red. So actually it would, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure you answered his question though. He's, he's Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, I think he was asking more, is the idea itself a progressive one, not so much will it result in results that are pro-progressive. It's what idea progressive? It's, so basically, if we're getting rid of the First Amendment, we're taking the guardrails off. Like there's no end-all, be-all rule that there's free speech. And if we're fighting an uphill battle to change the discourse around free speech anyway, is it worth the risk to take away that protection? So um, you might think that um, the, the, the downside risks are really large. I'm, 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 I'm afraid I'm going to repeat an answer I gave before, but I, I think it's the same answer. You might think the downside risks are really large. So maybe most of the time, um, the government is controlled by right-wingers. And, and, and if you've got rid of the First Amendment, those right-wingers are going to suppress progressive speech. So all of a sudden, um, you're not going to be allowed to criticize Trump, or 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 you're not you're not going to be allowed to advocate for gay rights or something like that. And I'm not I'm not saying you're wrong about that. But what I am saying is, if you're right about that, then you ought not to be a progressive, because look, if the government's going to be in the control of plutocrats, and and that's a sort of big risk and a permanent state of affairs then it's not just, the problem is not just free speech, they're also going to redistribute property in the wrong direction. But even if it's 50% of the time, like, are we comfortable with the actions they would take in that happen? Well, why are you comfortable with giving the, the government the power to redistribute property? If 50% of the time uh, the government's going to be in the control of right-wingers who are going <coughs> to pass tax cuts that give huge subsidies to millionaires and make uh, ordinary people miserable. Well, because there's certain property rights that are in the Constitution, so no matter who's in the government, there's certain boundaries they can't pass. Well, depending on how strict you think those boundaries are, you, you may or may not be a progressive. You might be a libertarian, right? So, so your view, I may, again, maybe I'm talking you into this. Your view might, I think this is the strongest argument for libertarianism. People who run the government are bound to be jerks, you know. And you you can um, 
you can have this idealistic notion that the good guys are going to take over the government, but they're not. They're going to be jerks. And therefore, we want to limit the government. Well, but you said even with progressivism, like, victories are temporary. Right. So a bunch of good right. guys can so look, the government tomorrow, and then in a decade, we could be right back where we are now. And so, so um, a decade, like six years. there is a kind of progressive faith that progressives hold on to just by the tips of their fingernails. But, but, but this, is, this is what it is. Yes, sometimes the government um, produces bad results. Sometimes they suppress progressive speech. Sometimes they pass the Trump tax cuts. But what's the alternative to that? The alternative to that is markets. And, and markets, also are, markets are also really terrible. Why? Because if you have more money, you can buy more. Right? Markets don't distribute things fairly. They, they give more power uh, to people who have more money, and they don't get more money because they work harder. They get more money often because they inherit it. Right? So, so we have two bad things. And the question is, the question progressives and libertarians have to answer is, which is worse? And what it means to be a progressive, I think, is to say, no, governments are not perfect. They're going to do a lot of bad things also. And, and when, when they're doing bad things, we ought to oppose them, right? But the best chance for justice is to do something about markets. And the, some, maybe the something will be done by having Lara go and lecture people about their moral obligations. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm a less optimistic person than... Um, she is, who was it Lyndon Johnson who said, uh, grab them by the balls and their hearts and minds will follow, right? Um, maybe sometimes people have to be forced and, 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 and the, the, the institution that's going to do the forcing is, is the government. And, and then, so what this rests on in the end, I think, is again a kind of faith that, that if, if the system is roughly democratic, People are going to vote for stuff that's humane and decent. But maybe that's wrong. And, and I do have to say what's happened in the last few years shakes my faith in that. How much of what's happened in the last few years would you ascribe to Citizens United in terms of so influence on elections? I, 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 uh, for technical reasons, um, um, it turns out, I, I think Citizens United itself uh, doesn't ha hasn't made a huge difference. Um, the the uh, uh, I, I I won't go into that, but but I, I want to make another point, which is related to the arguments I just made. Um, progressives um, very casually say Citizens United ought to be overruled. What they don't realize, I think, is how deeply overruling Citizens United cuts into standard First Amendment doctrine, which many progressives, I think, mistakenly support. So why do I say that? Well, what Citizens United said um, was that uh, the government can't regulate the amount of money that corporations spend to elect candidates. Who's a corporation that spends money to elect candidates? The New York Times. It, uh, the New York Times is a corporation. Um, it uh, pays money. It, it spends money writing editorials um, saying, vote for Hillary Clinton. If Citizens United comes out the other way, then it turns out the New York Times doesn't have First Amendment rights, and the government could say, stop writing editorials saying, vote for Hillary Clinton. So, so um, now, my view is, I, I don't believe in the First Amendment. So I think that that's right. That's the way it ought to come out. But for progressives who say we ought to overrule Citizens United, think about what you're saying. You're agreeing with me, right? So Citizens United itself, it was about a movie. Um, so this group, Citizens United, put out a movie um, uh, about Hillary Clinton. And, and the Federal Election Commission said, you cannot put out that movie because you're spending corporate funds 
to try to get Hillary Clinton elected. The point at which the argument was lost before the Supreme Court was when the justices started saying, well, what about if they published a book? And um, the Solicitor General, who was arguing in favor of the loss, had to say, well, that's right. You know, the government could stop them from publishing a book criticizing Hillary Clinton. seems like you laid out that the ways for change in this country have been the markets historically, which have been slow and at times have had disastrous results, or you have the government. And the axiom you're playing on, which I think they were getting at as well, is the one of national power versus local and state power. I think you know, the Colin Kaepernick analogy was a bad one. I think you might have selected the wrong case study because it seemed like the founder's idea, which I understand you may disagree with, was trying to build a government that granted more power to state and local entities than a federal one. Uh, the, the whole point of the Constitution was to empower the federal government. The, 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 the Articles of Confederation had lots and lots of power for state governments. Uh, the, the framers didn't like that, and so they tried to give the federal government more power. But I think they would have understood that, especially in time today, some of them would have said to argue that the government is growing out of control in a sense. And either rein it in or return some of this tax control to the, the state. Uh, I, I actually don't know what, if, if James Madison knew our current conditions, what he would say. It's pretty, pretty hard to figure that out. But, but suppose he would say that. I, what, I, what I'd say is, who cares? I mean, he, look, James, whatever else you want to say about James Madison, he's dead. None of, none of this is going to matter to him. So, so uh, but we're alive. This is our country. You know, Thomas Jefferson once said, um, um, far, uh, prior generations are like a, like a foreign government. Uh, and the analogy is a really a powerful one. So, so I wouldn't say for a moment that um, the United States, the way the United States are, behaves, what kind of country we have, we, have, we ought to cede it to France or to the General Assembly of the UN. No, we're Americans. We get to decide. So I also don't think we ought to cede it to people who died 200 years ago. Um, this is for, for us to, to decide. Now, in terms of the balance between state and federal power, um, I, I think that, that is a complicated co subject. And it's, it is, um, I think one's views on it ought to be uh, radically contingent, depending on who it is who's more likely to achieve progressive goals. But there is a reason why historically progressives have generally been nationalists. And the reason is that the more localized um, power is, uh, the easier it is for uh, people with wealth to avoid regulation by uh, threatening to move from one state to another. Um, so that they, they can, um, um, if New York uh, wants to impose a $15 minimum wage, it's very hard for them to do that because all of the uh, businesses might move to New Jersey. So if you want government regulation, there is an argument in favor of having as big a unit as possible to prevent that kind of um, escape. So I By the way, I just want to compliment you people. Um, these are terrific points. And um, one of the things, I, I'm getting a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach as we go through this. As, as my position gets chipped away, I'm beginning to think, do I, do I have any position here at all? So I'm glad we're stopping at 4 o'clock. I'm completely humiliated. But, but go ahead. Well, so um, I really like the Jefferson quote that you referenced. I hadn't heard that before. But I do, so I've been reading a lot of um, Jill LaFleur recently, who is a historian, um, and she talks a lot about Did you read her new book? I haven't actually read it. It's a lot of fun. Book, but yeah. Well, and one of, the, one of the arguments she makes is that progressives uh, have made the mistake of throwing out some important common ground with 
other Americans who just fundamentally don't think about these things as much as we do, um, or they don't they don't think about the sort of highfalutin ideals that academics tend to think about as much. So, um, don't you think there's a bit of a danger in throwing out appeals to our lineage and appeals to a kind of shared national history? Yeah, I, I, I do think there's a risk, but um, but we have to understand what our history is. And um, here's something that's really interesting that I don't think Lepore pays enough attention to. Some of the um, most revered figures in our country and some of the greatest moments in the history of our country have involved um, disregarding the Constitution. So uh, l let me give you some examples. Um, uh, we, we were talking about Jefferson a moment ago. Uh, Jefferson was re responsible for, for the was responsible for the Louisiana Purchase. Jefferson thought and said <coughs> that the Louisiana Purchase was unconstitutional. He didn't think he had the constitutional power to do it, and so the first thing he did was he started drafting. Jefferson did this stuff himself. He started drafting a constitutional amendment that would give him the power. Um, but then um, it looked like if he didn't act really quickly, there was this elaborate negotiation both with France and with Spain, and it looked like it was all going to fall apart. And what he said, both in his contemporary correspondence, and then he wrote about this years later, he said, you know what, it's more important for um, us to have Louisiana than to obey the Constitution. So he said, I'm just going to do it. And he later defended that. He said, you know, it's true, we violated the Constitution. Look, we've now got the Louisiana Territory. Um, if you ask me what is the single greatest moment in American history, it's the Emancipation Proclamation. Well, um, Lincoln was on record over and over again saying that the federal government did not have the right to free slaves, um, something that's widely, not widely remembered. Um, at the time um, when he was inaugurated, there was a constitutional amendment pending in Congress. Uh, it had passed Congress. Um, ironically, it was the 13th Amendment. And what the amendment said was there is an absolute right of slaveholders to have their slaves the gov federal government cannot interfere with it, and this amendment is not amendable, okay? In his inaugural address in 1861, Lincoln endorsed that amendment. He said, if anybody asks, I'm for it, and he said, the reason I'm for it is because it doesn't change existing law. That's true now. Um, about six months before the Emancipation Proclamation, a general uh, as it happens, it was uh, Fremont who had run for president in 1856 as a Republican. He had control of some territory, and he said, as a war measure, I'm going to free all the slaves. Lincoln fired him for that, and he, uh, we don't have any, uh, it's no mystery why he fired him. He, he wrote what Fremont did was unconstitutional. He said, you know, it's okay to take property, to use it to fight a, a war if, if, if the property is being used against you, but you've got to give it back after the war is over. Um, so what did Lincoln do then? He turned around and he signed the Emancipation Proclamation, a, a clearly unconstitutional act. Um, and um, it was widely understood that way at the time. He just, he, he transformed the nature of the war by ignoring a constitution that got in the way. Um, Franklin Roosevelt, um, the, I think, um, and, and a lot of scholars agree with me, many of them are on the right, but not all of them, Bruce Ackerman is on the left, the New Deal was mostly unconstitutional. Um, and uh, Roosevelt, it, it's not, most people don't read this speech today, but I think one of the greatest speeches he ever gave, if not the greatest, was on uh, the 
what was it, I guess 150th anniversary of the ratification of the Constitution, something like that. On Constitution Day, he gave an outdoor speech at the Washington Monument, a huge throng of people, and it was about the Constitution. And what he said was, you people are misunderstanding the Constitution. It's not, a, it's not like a will or a, a, a deed or a contract where it's got legal requirements that you have to follow. But what the Constitution does is, is it just sort of inspires us. And judges who go around enforcing terms of the Constitution uh, to prevent the government from doing what it wants, they're, they're not acting legitimately. OK, so, so yes, we need to connect with our history, but we need to understand what it, what it is. Um, and that's one way to think about it. Um, and, and that's what ought to be taught in seventh grade civics classes. It's going to take some work to get, <laughs> change the curriculum. Yeah. Mostly aren't seventh grade civics classes anymore. <laughs> so it's interesting that Jefferson has come up so much because yeah. Jefferson uh, once uh, proposed the idea of having a constitutional convention every 18 years. Right. So right. Would you subscribe to that? Would you? I think that would be a great idea. Um, I, I think a lot of the problems with the Constitution would go away if it were more like an ordinary statute. With it, where, where we could change it. Um, so uh, actually, Maryland, this hasn't worked very well, but Maryland has a provision that the state constitution has to come up for referendum every 10 years or something like that. Um, and, but the reason it doesn't, I mean, so people just vote for it again. <laughs> but, but, but I do, th yeah, I do think. Um, the worst provision in the Constitution is Article 5, which makes the Constitution almost impossible to amend. It, it, um, the, the American Constitution is widely thought to be the hardest Constitution in the world to amend. And as a practical matter now, it's really impossible. Um, and that's not a good state of affairs. Have you changed your mind since Great and Extraordinary Occasion? Um, <laughs> The, uh, uh, thank you for asking about that. Um, so the, the document itself that, um, that, that this was an organization I um, was the reporter for, and the document itself was a, 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 uh, um, a joint piece of work, and I didn't agree with everything in it. I, I did agree with the basic insight that we want to stop constitutionalizing our arguments. So the, the argument was against constitutional amendments that tried by constitutional amendment and constitutional compulsion to cut off debate about things that ought to be debatable. And when, when, when the aims of, the, the, of it are put that way, I'm completely in favor of it. But, but the honest answer is my views have evolved some since then. Yeah. I have to say I'm very sympathetic with like the worries about constitutionalization, judicialization of politics. But uh, I wonder if you're advising a young progressive who might be in the audience today. Okay, you have a limited amount of time and energy, as do your fellow progressives. Uh, do you put your time and energy into changing hearts and minds about the First Amendment and the constitutionalization of politics? Or do you advocate for the redistribution of wealth? Oh, the latter, for sure. <laughs> okay. So what am I doing up here? Oh, it's in order of operations. Right. It's, it's, it's all her fault. It's what it's into some of these problems get resolved Actually, in a fair, fair bargaining of, you know, with a redistribution of wealth, a better, a better uh, hard there, as you might say. All right. Well, Chief, thank you so much. I, I actually learned something from this, so I really appreciate it.